Number 10, the young czar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too, even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9, Nero Steam. We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives, wait, that's, we gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that's, theatrics are important, remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath, where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that. For shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry, no, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right, 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. Yeah. Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. Well, all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can, like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss. So much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it's said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather, uh, well, mistreatment of women. YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number five, domestic disturbance. William the Conqueror was one down bad dude. The illegitimate ruler to the throne left a bad taste in some people's mouths and was just as ruthless in silencing those rebellions that were always uprising against him as he was with the famous battles he was a part of, like the Battle of Hastings. But what I think he should be remembered by is the way he asked Matilda to marry him, or rather the extreme measures he took when she refused his advantage because he was an illegitimate leader. William dragged Matilda by the hair out into the middle of the street and beat her until she agreed to marry him. I don't have to tell you how messed up that is, and I sure hope I don't. Number four, Nero Sauna. 
The Romans were kind of a big deal, especially if you're into history. Large city, culture, and some other structures are still around today. That's kind of cool. But while the city of Rome may have been the best city on earth at the time, Romans themselves could use a little work. Meet Emperor Nero, the vicious leader of Rome who became emperor through ill-gotten gains. However, in what may have been one of the first acts of flexing the male patriarchy, the divorce or forced separation of his wife Claudia Octavia comes to mind. It was a rocky marriage from the start. There was a general dislike from the very beginning, but when Nero remarried, as emperors did, he had Octavia banished to an island, where shortly after she would be suffocated in a hot vapor bath. Her demise was sad for most Romans. Oh yeah, and they tried to make it look like she did herself in. That's messed up, man. Number 3. Pedestal I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal sometimes. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous. A promising athlete, really enjoys collecting stamps. You go little rock star, collect those presidential stamps. However, Emperor Caligula of Rome had some other ideas. He would literally put his wife, who he claimed to love, up on a pedestal stark naked and let his friends in the military gawk and glare at her. He would also say to her that he could end her life whenever he wanted and put a knife against her for no reason. Weird flex, but okay. This guy was awful to everyone as he tormented and unalived so many people. Well, you sure wouldn't want to see his face everywhere as he liked to do just that. Built statues of himself everywhere because after losing your family to his tyranny and looking at his wife, you need to know who's responsible for all this. That's messed up. Number 2. Doozong 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 That wouldn't really be a great fraternity name, would it? Well, the Emperor of Doozong of China would think differently as when he was in charge, that's pretty much what the royal court looked like. Enough drinking to keep AA in meetings for 100 years, and enough ladies of the evening to... Well, I don't have a joke for this one, but there were a lot of them, trust me. Having massive parties like that and enjoying the company of other women is not how you respect your wife. To make matters worse, it seemed that too much partying may have been a bad thing. Who would have thought? As what he made up for in a fun weekend, he lacked in governing, as the Mongols were at his front door, or gate rather. Eventually, his empire would burn to the ground. All thanks to Al. Alcohol. And many women who laid down for their lives, literally. Number 1. Side Piece Look, I enjoy the company of a woman just as much as the next king sits on his throne. But in my opinion, once you find a wife, it's time to settle down, relax, no more crazy parties like Duzong. This is another generalization, but every king did this. Every king in the past has had mistresses. As if that is a totally okay thing to do to your wife and oftentimes the queen of your kingdom. I'm a reasonable guy, so maybe I can see having your side piece waiting in the wings to be stage center, but it's never one, is it? It's always multiple. Ladies of the past, all I can say is make sure you give birth to a boy and watch your back. They're coming for you. Number 10, King Charles I. You can put any king down on this list, really. Uh, people weren't as kind and loving as we are now. Or, or well, less cruel, I guess. <laughs> king Charles was no different from any other. A monarch sniffing his own farts up in his castle, doing his very best to snuff out religious groups that he didn't agree with. A lot of guys were like that. It's brutal, but that's history, folks. Well, one such measure he took, I think, was so wrong, so heinous, and so criminal, and so offensive, that he should have been locked up for life. During the 1600s, this man, in an effort to curb religious views, outlawed Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Outlawed Christmas. That means no gifts, no tree, no Santa Claus, no turkey, no stuffing, no nothing. This was quickly dissolved after he was removed from office. And yes, I know Santa Claus wasn't there then, but st it's still, it's Santa Claus, it's Christmas. Can't have Christmas without Santa Claus. Number nine, William the Conqueror. You've all probably heard the name William the Conqueror. Battle of Hastings, illegitimate son of the king fighting for the throne. Very violently too, I might add. However, today I want to talk about his dating skills. Look, dating can be hard. I, I get that. There's a lot of anxiety, especially when self-image comes into play. Ooh, I'm too fat. I hate my nose. And what are these legs? Ugh, no one's gonna like me. Everyone thinks like that. And it's always usually right before a date, too. You could be staring in the mirror, and then all of a sudden all your bruises, pimples, and blemishes seem to show up out of nowhere. It's weird how that works. Well, William was different though, he, he was more confident. 
He didn't have confidence issues like the rest of us. To quote a brilliant chemist, he was the one who knocks. As the story goes, he was quite fond of one lass. She was not fond of him. Classic story, really. So after trying to court her several times and failing, he decided to drag her on the ground by her hair until she said yes. Don't, don't do that, that's, that's bad. Number eight, Kangas Khan. I don't think some folks realize just how brutal this guy really was. I mean, if you've ever played the Ghost of Tsushima game on PlayStation, then you know exactly what the Mongol Horde is capable of. Mossy things. The man carved out most of Asia and parts of Europe. In one battle allegedly taking the lives of one million people. And all that remained was a mountain of bones and human fat. Ooh, gross. He's been known on how not to treat a lady and reportedly liked to use his young and newest soldiers as arrow fodder by creating human shields with them. A lot of conscripts in his army were often taken from villages and he conquered. It's kind of how he kept the machine going. So either fight with me or that's picture app for you. What a nice guy. What a swell nice guy. Jeez. Number seven, Galizo Maria Saforza. This guy was just bad. Like, like all bad. Not like Deadpool where he does some bad stuff for good reasons, anti-hero kind of guy. This, nah, this guy's just straight bad, straight evil. In one story of the disturbed king, he had a rival's hands chopped off. No more tennis matches. He left prisoners in hanging cages and even had a priest that made a prediction about him that he didn't find all too flattering in prison with little food and water. It got to the point where the man had to eat his own refuse. So if you cross Galeazzo Maria Saforza, um, don't, don't do it. Number six, Ivan the Terrible. I'm not that familiar with Russian history before the year 1900, but there is a lot to unpack. It's not all Lenin and hammers and sickles and such. Ivan the Terrible was the first czar of Russia, and he was quite the specimen. From having struck his daughter-in-law and unlifing his son in a fit of rage, he was one nasty dude. However, I believe the story of him in St. Basil's Cathedral is more noteworthy. As the story goes, Ivan commissioned an architect to build St. Basil's Cathedral. If you've ever seen it, you know how gorgeous it is. All the Onion Palace buildings and whatnot, you know what I'm talking about. Ivan was so impressed with the architect's work that he had his eyes gouged out so that no one could ever build another structure or gaze upon another structure as magnificent as the cathedral. That's hardcore, dude. That's pretty hardcore. So if you do a bad job, he probably would have got rid of you. And if you do a good job, he'll still get rid of you. Number five, the terror of London. If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean, who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening. And what can be called the first, or one of the first modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the terror of London was. However, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria herself, although there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen's Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer? We'll never know. Number four, short kings unite. Even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank God I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely five feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously. Number three, dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just wanna be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Just why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room where the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down while you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. 
Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, it's also just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, and influential that you create two Western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs, and I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts, which, if you also ask my mom, is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s. At least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number one, send lewds. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time. It was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing, but you know. Number 10, Marie Antoinette. I wonder what it must have been like to be the Queen of France. To sit in a palace and eat all those delicious foods that your cooks can make while the peasants outside struggle to eat and sing about bread for some reason. I don't know, lay Miz reverence. It's a life of beauty, balls, and not listening to what the stinky peasants outside have to say. Except that's the very reason why Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France. You can only spend so much time and money on your exuberant lifestyle before the people get fed up. I mean, these people have nothing. It's kind of difficult to control people when they don't even have food at home. They let the queen know how upset they were when they decided to remove her head from her body. Number nine, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. Sometimes it's just in the name, isn't it? Like Mario, you know that he's an Italian plumber. Or Luigi, you can tell that that's an Italian plumber's brother. And uh, King DDD, king of the DDDs or, or something, I, I don't know. Okay, maybe the names don't always give it away, but Bloody Mary does. Most known for her liberal use of the wooden stake and the whole uh, burning folks alive thing. I, I wish I could tell you it was for barbecue, but it was actually for some more serious religious persecution and, and reformation. The Catholic Church was hot, but the witches and heretics burning at the stake or hotter, no cap. Number eight, Reina Valona of Madagascar. This one is a new one for me. Didn't know about this, but here we go. So basically, Queen Reina, Queen, I'm, gonna say, I'm just gonna call her Queen Ravioli because I can't pronounce it. Basically, Queen Ravioli takes over from her past husband. She says to herself, how can I make things better? Oh, I know, how about I become a ruthless, bloodthirsty, unaliving tyrant? Great idea, right? Yes, very, uh, not great success. Yes, unfortunately, she did many heinous things. Something I found out to be particularly interesting, however, was her destroying the many good things her husband had set up before her. Madagascar had some European intervention, and while it's true that a lot of times that is a bad thing, and yeah, it's a bad thing, and it does bring some bad stuff with it, however, it also brings a lot of good things with it. In Madagascar's case, it was markets, modern schools, trade, and diplomacy with, with Europe, and that's, that's good, money's good, you like that. Well, the queen wasn't having any of that, so she reformed. And by that, I mean she repressed and, and re-unalive people. Number seven, Empress Irene. Kings, queens, emperors, and empresses. Chances are these folks are related. It's a family thing, a mia familia, you know what I mean? It's how it goes when you're the king, and you need a son to continue the lineage. Even though, I would like to argue that if you're gone, you're gone. So who really cares who's taken over? Just my opinion. Speaking of eye gouging, Oh, wait, I didn't mention that before. I made a segue, but okay, that's all right, bad segue. Well, the, the topic of discussion here is Empress Irene. Basically, her son was taking too much power for himself. She was losing hers and yada yada, and his eyes were gouged out from two guards ordered by his dear, sweet mother. Can you blame her though? I mean, come on, he was threatening a rule. She worked so hard to get there. The chief was just silent on this one. Chief had no words for that one, guys. No words. Number six, Fu Hao. 
Another woman in history married to a man of the stinky patriarchy. Worst! Except, Fu Hao didn't want to be wife 57 of 64. She wanted more than that. And to be honest, I think that's fair. You go girl, who wants to be wife 57 of 64? Maybe some people in Utah, I don't know. What's maybe slightly more unholy than having that many wives is going on an epic military campaign and raging war in the Shang Dynasty. A warrior queen, if you will. We know some of this history based on her tomb as she was buried with ceremonial weapons, knives, blades, swords, some dogs, some uh, human sacrifices, gold, money, jade, and lots of other valuable goodies. Just makes you want to loot all the stuff in there, doesn't it? I mean, Jade's pretty cool. This was a common practice amongst male warriors back then, but you know what? Good for her and all that unaliving. Way to go, sister. I like it. Very nice. Okay. In our number five spot today, we have the execution of Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell, the original fixer, the 16th century equivalent of that friend who always has a guy for everything. He climbed the ranks to become King Henry's right hand man, and for the time, everything was peachy. From the shadows, Cromwell pulled the strings, masterminding moves that reshaped England itself. But every puppeteer's show has a finale. Enter Anne of Cleves, as we just covered, the king's fourth wife. She's a German princess and Cromwell thinks, hey, she'd be perfect for Hank. So Cromwell, doing the old world equivalent of a blind date setup, arranges the royal marriage. But when Henry clasps eyes on Anne, it's less than love at first sight. Apparently her portrait might have had that 16th century Photoshop touch. So what does a king do when his trusted wingman sets him up on the most awkward blind date in history and he's now married to her? If you guessed, behead the matchmaker, you're thinking like a Tudor monarch. Poor Cromwell goes from VIP to RIP faster than you can say divorce. Arrested and with accusations of treason thrown his way, Cromwell soon found himself at the wrong end of the executioner's axe. So let this be a lesson in the dangerous dance of Tudor politics. One misstep, like say a mismatched royal marriage, could cost you your head, literally. In our number four spot today, we have Margaret Pole. Enter Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury. Now, before you imagine a frail old lady knitting in a rocking chair, let me set the record straight. Margaret was a tough cookie. With royal blood flowing through her veins, she wasn't just any old countess. But in the treacherous game of Tudor politics, blue blood doesn't always act as an armor. Now, Margaret managed to reach the ripe old age of 67, a feat in itself in those days. But instead, Instead of getting a gold watch and retiring in the countryside, she got a date with the executioner. In short, this all tied back to politics, her noble lineage, and her perceived threat to the Tudor dynasty. And in a cringeworthy twist, her beheading was more amateur hour than swift and professional. It took several clumsy blows before the poor countess was finally granted her exit ticket from Henry's mad world. So next time you're diving into the juicy tales of Tudor England, spare a thought for Margaret Pole and the many others who met the their end at the hands of an executioner, proving that in Henry's court, even the lesser known characters had starring roles in some of history's goriest dramas. In our number three spot today, we have The Pilgrimage of Grace. Northern England, 1536. As the chill of autumn creeps in, another storm is brewing, but this one has nothing to do with the weather. The North is buzzing, not with the latest trends in Tudor fashion, but with outrage over Henry's religious U-turns and his let's knock down some monasteries approach. Enter the rebels. Calling their movement the Pilgrimage of Grace, these folks weren't just out for a leisurely stroll. Thousands of them rallied against the king's reforms, demanding a return to the good old days. Picture angry monks, furious nobles, and a whole bunch of peasants waving banners and medieval pitchforks. Now, King Henry, ever the diplomat, and by diplomat, I mean guy who really doesn't want a massive revolt on his hands, decides to parlay. Okay, okay, disband, go home, and all will be forgiven. All right, let's just clear the slate. The rebels, thinking that they've just won, happily head home, but plot twist. Henry pulls the oldest trick in the monarch's playbook, the old bait and switch. Instead of peace and pardons, many of the rebellion's leaders got a one-way ticket to the chopping block. Moral of the story, in Tudor England, if King Henry VIII promises you something, maybe don't be too quick to take him at his word. After all, actions definitely speak louder than words, especially when the action is a date with the executioner, all right? In our number two spot today, we have the exploitative laws. 
Ah, oh, King Henry VIII, the cunning monarch with an insatiable appetite for power, wives, and as we're about to discover, other people's wealth. Enter stage right, a set of deviously clever laws. These weren't just your regular tax reforms or trade policies. Oh no, these laws gave the crown the power to snatch up the properties of those who died without heirs. Seems straightforward, right? But here's where the plot thickens. You see, this law often danced a macabre tango with charges of treason. If a nobleman, or really any unlucky soul, was accused of treason and met the grim fate of the executioner, they often left behind vast lands and treasures. With the charges of treason hanging over their head, any direct heirs were often disinherited. And with the new laws in place, guess who had first dibs on all of these abandoned riches? You got it, our man Henry and his gleeful council. So with a master stroke, the Tudor monarch could silence his opponents and seize their wealth, all while giving it the veneer of legality. In the grand game of power, Henry played his cards with ruthless efficiency, ensuring that dissent was not only quashed, but also turned profitable for the crown. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Carthusian monks' execution. The Carthusians weren't your everyday monks. These fellows were like the elite athletes of the religious world. Renowned for their unwavering commitment to their faith and their austere lifestyle, they were looked up to as the spiritual heavyweights of England. Their devotion was so fierce that even the ordinary folks whispered their names in reverence. But as the wind of religious change swept through Tudor England, these holy men found themselves caught in a storm of royal proportions. You see, King Henry, in his quest to become the supreme head of the Church of England, expected every Tom, Dick, and Harry to toe the line. But the Carthusians? They weren't about to bend their beliefs, not even for the king. And so, as these monks stood firm, refusing to recognize Henry's supremacy over the Pope, they essentially painted a target on their backs. Their defiance was met with Henry's notorious wrath. In 1535, in a horrifying display of power and cruelty, three priors were subjected to the gruesome fate of being hanged, drawn, and quartered, a grisly warning to any who dared to challenge the crown. But the persecution didn't end there. As the years rolled on, more monks faced the king's fury. Some met the sharp edge of the executioner's axe, while others were thrown in the kingdom's darkest dungeons, left to wither away in a slow dance of hunger and despair. Through it all, the Carthusians' steadfastness in the face of such brutality became the stuff of legends. Their tale stands as a testament to the lengths people will go to uphold their beliefs, even when pitted against the mightiest of kings. Number 10. No one's ever really gone. You may have heard that said when losing a family member, a pet, or in the worst Star Wars movies ever made. Sorry, not sorry Disney, those are terrible. But perhaps there is someone who is never really gone. Kangas Khan, yes that's right, the ruthless Mongol warrior who conquered so much in his time that we're still talking about it today. So why is this big bad warrior still with us today? Well, that's because of DNA. Yeah, in his time there was uh, lots of activities going on, besides the usual pillaging the village and unaliving those who oppose you. There were a lot of happy endings, let's say, and by that I mean forced non-YouTube friendly conduct bedroom happy endings. So much so that when a study was conducted back in 2003, 8% of men in Asia were thought to be descendants of the mighty man himself. 0.5% worldwide. That doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about millions of people here. Next time you go out, you may be brushing shoulders with the warrior's kin. Prepare for battle! Number 9. Henry again? Boy, it's really hard not to talk about this guy. But dude was kinda down bad for it. He's just most well known for his mistreatment of his wives, and by mistreatment, I don't mean getting into a fight over whether or not the toilet seat should be up or down, and then having a very toxic argument in front of family members. No, because when Henry was upset with marriage, he wanted divorce, which honestly was kind of taboo for the time. Oh yeah, and he also beheaded two of his wives because... That's how it goes. I know every couple has their issues to work out, but for most dads out there, having sun-drenched beer-fueled weekends, they never go beheading after that. Although, dad's been staring at the lawnmower for a while and there's a lot of blades on that. I don't... Dad? 
While it is true King Henry VIII did behead two wives, he didn't do it to all of them. And at some points we're honestly quite pleased with his holy sanctity of marriage. Anyone who's ever been married can tell you how peaceful and sacred that bond really is. Number 8. The People's Princess Okay, I know Prince Charles isn't exactly a king, but he is royalty and the man kinda did Diana dirty. That's a quick and half put together allusion to a Michael Jackson song for the English majors in the audience. Being royalty isn't easy. Being royalty in a modern age when paparazzi overwhelm you with lights and cameras just for a juicy piece of gossip like, when was your last bowel movement? Is it slow? Extra extra, read all about it, the princess is constipated. That's just not fun. So after Prince Charles and Princess Diana had been married for a few years, you can understand how excited the media was to find out about their marital disputes. There was three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded, was a quote by Princess Diana that gave the media a field day. Sadly, Prince Charles was having an affair, and it wouldn't be too much longer that Diana would perish in a car accident that may or may not be organized by the royal family themselves. Number 7. Midlife Crisis this one's kind of generalized because if I didn't, I'd have to mention almost every king ever. So here we go. Back in ye olde times, the access to better healthcare just wasn't there. Doctors aren't washing hands. Imagine, buddy eats some greasy mutton and then says, all right, time for your enema. But those aren't the only greasy hands around certain orifices I'm talking about. I'm talking about kings marrying older girls at the ripe age of 12. Yep, that's right. Nothing says experience and womanhood like being 12. People didn't live long, and oftentimes these arranged marriages had ulterior motives, like alliances or business, really. However, that does not make up for marrying a 12-year-old who may or may not have started those super weird changing times, like when you were 12, and now there's hair showing up in places that you didn't know there could be hair. I sent a courier to the chief, and he came back with this message. It ain't it. Number 6. Till death do us part Love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage, but sometimes the crooning words of Frank Sinatra aren't enough to keep people in love. Sometimes marriages end up like the ones we see on sitcoms, but when there's no laugh track, it's not very funny, and sometimes divorce is the answer. Uh? Medieval Germans thought this too, and something they practiced was divorce by combat. Basically the man goes into a hole with his arm tied behind his back and the woman is free to move around with a sack of rocks. These proceedings are strange as I'm sure no husband or wife married today would ever get so frustrated with one another that they would want to hit one another on the head with rocks. Oh the blessings of being married. Number 5. George V. Turned out this guy loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much though, I'd say. It was almost distracting. It was taking up many hours of his day. Like, you know, focus on other things. Like say maybe, I don't know, the war. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everyone's trying to stay alive. George is just in the background like. Like all collections, they started at an early age. It's now at a point where it's just, you know, past impressive and borderline strange. Especially if you're a royal, like you're really going hard with this. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages, full of stamps. That's 20,000 pages full of stamps. That's a lot, way too many stamps. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather the King of Philately. That's the official term for collecting stamps. We're historians here, we have to make it official. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record Ho ho! The most money ever spent on a stamp. This guy dropped like 220,000 on one single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about the fool who had spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp. And he was proud. He was like, oh, that fool? It was I. Number four. Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. Yeah, some princes collected stamps, others collect zoo animals. We're all different. Yeah, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and not bears, but orangutans. So good luck getting your eight hours. He also collected human artifacts, like body parts after they've been, you know, so that's, watch your step, I guess. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Watch out for the lion's tail. Careful, what a mess. He's quite important in history though, I guess. He supported the scientific revolution and he also poured tons of money into astrology, so next time you read your horoscope, remember it's Bones in the Jar Benny that's responsible for that one. And also, in case you're wondering, yeah, he didn't pay attention to any of his wives or anything like that. He was just, no, nope, jars for me, jars and animals, I'm all set. Number three, Don Carlos. Spanish crown prince, the guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Let's talk about him. Back in the mid-1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was, 
Yeah, I want to say worse things, but he was just a really bad person. YouTube, he was just a bad guy. Now, it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter than the other. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him with these disabilities growing up and people often feel bad for him a little. To that, I say don't. Nah, don't do it. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad. Dude was fine. Philip II of Spain? Yeah, he would hurt a lot of people. He would hurt animals and people just for fun. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how the pair of boots looked. He made somebody eat boots. We're not gonna feel bad for him on Bumblebee today. That's not what we're gonna do. He was also set up to marry Queen Elizabeth of Valois, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours, she was like, no, that's not gonna happen, no way. So she married his father instead. That's what happens, that's what happens when you're in 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos. Mary, Queen of Scots, was one of them. Margaret of Valois, well, we know what happened with her, and Anna of Austria. But his mental conditions grew worse and it went south. Shocker. Number two, Heart of Glass. King Charles VI, once nicknamed the Beloved and then quickly nicknamed the Mad. What happened? After he became King of France in 1380, he would have these episodes, let's call them. He would believe he was made of glass and he didn't want anybody to touch him. He had this glass delusion, which was surprisingly not uncommon, believe it or not, for this time period. Believing you were made out of glass in some way, shape, or form, be it in your head, butt, shoulders, or back, really spiked around the mid 1400s. And Charles VI, AKA Charles the Mad, he wouldn't let anybody, not even his wife, near him at all. I'm not making fun of somebody for having a fear like that. I mean, most likely historians believe he was schizophrenic, so obviously I'm not ripping on that. But Alexandria of Bavaria, another royal who had this glass delusion, she too believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass, so she had to enter rooms sideways to avoid it chattering. I don't know what's going on with this glass delusion, but I'm glad it went away, I don't know. And finally, number one, King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians. So that should already tell you a good amount of this guy. George was another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his, you know, intimate side quests, if you know what I'm saying here, like all these other kings we've talked about. He was a bit busy being a stupid fool. This man was trying literally everything to get a woman to sleep with him. Although he was the king and he was already set up, he was like, nope, I'm gonna go and keep trying with strangers and random. And he would throw a tantrum if they said no, or he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get the girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? One of those kind of monsters. He would also keep uh, trophies, lack of a better term, of all these conquests afterwards. He would ask each people that he slept with for a little piece of hair and then he would would keep them, he would like store them. Back then it was kind of common, I guess, for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, weirdly enough, because you don't have phone numbers or like any sort of way to remember someone, photos, I don't know. So you kept their hair. But after the king died, his brother found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. So yeah, I'll leave you on that note. There's a hair in my mouth, that's kind of gross. Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Old Blighty, I think of royal prestige. London and Buckingham Palace. After all, that's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. Man, she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness, I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey, step bro. Now, as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So I'll just close the door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number eight, breaking tradition. For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love, or so wish to swoon. 
Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Abernathy am asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you be wrong in thinking that's how it went for old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was going to have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number seven, did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power, and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, all attempts to end her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might have heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five. Nothing left. Alexander the Great was an excellent warrior for his time. Having conquered so much at a young age is really quite impressive. His empire stretched from Greece all the way to India. For a history class or a good book, this is fine, but in reality, he was a conqueror. The places he was marching into weren't exactly happy to have spear-wielding visitors. He laid siege on multiple cities, executed those who defied him, and sold people into YouTube's least favorite S-word. Just about checks off everything a guy needs to be considered a tyrant. History remembers his conquest, but I for sure will not forget how brutal conquerors can really be. Number four, Chop Chop. While Maximilian Robespierre was not a king in the monarch sense, he did hold a lot of political power in France when the political climate was quite messy. Plus, France was at war. But even messier than that is the way he dealt with citizens who were deemed anti-revolution by sending them to the guillotine. Within a one year period, he sent 17,000 people to their dooms via the National Razor, or as it became to be known. He even began practicing deism, something he called the cult of the supreme being. And if you know your history, you know that you can't get away with that forever. And with some sweet poetic justice, Rosepierre was sentenced to the guillotine. Number three, all my friends are dead. Usually when people expire, the human thing to do is bury said lifeless human. It's just what we do. But apparently Ferdinand I of Naples did not get that memo. Instead, taking a page from Night of the Museum. No, this is not a cute comedy movie starring Ben Stiller, but in reality a complete horrifying nightmare. Ferdinand took the saying, keep your enemies close, a little too literally, as his favorite form of punishment was to mummify his enemies. Which let's face it, if he's a king, there's gonna be plenty. And he would like to display these mummies and what's probably the coolest place to be if you're into that weird goth stuff. He did keep some alive in the dungeon, but he much preferred his guests embalmed, where he would have them dressed up on display, just as they were before making the mistake of crossing Ferdinand. Now, what's the point of having that hardcore collection if you're not going to show it off? Well, he did. To the people he suspected of treason, which in a place like that, treason leaves your mind pretty quick. Number two, average height for the time. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists of his time, maybe of all time. With full support of the French army, Napoleon found himself earning gallant victories one after another, all being accomplished at a very young age. However, after years of grand success in multiple wars and kicking a lot of imperial butt, it started to go to his head. Shortly after the coup that overthrew Robespierre, 
Napoleon had gained enough support to claim himself as the Emperor of France. With said power, dissolved the freedom of press, reduced the rights of women, and oh yeah, he was at war with most of Europe for years to come. While his military victories cannot be understated, his rise as a tyrannical dictator makes him very unholy. Number 1. Dracula There's been a lot of unholy things said here today, but old Vladdy takes the cake. What he lacked in land and power, he made up for in his brutality. As the legends go, Vlad was creative in his punishments, and was well noted for his human art pieces. And by art, I mean impaling his enemy on pikes, sometimes to their rear ends, and leaving them as warnings for anyone who dared cross him. Similar to the time, visiting envoys wouldn't remove their hats as it is to do in tradition, so Vlad had their hats nailed to their skulls, so that they may never remove them. There are a few other stories that are just too hot for YouTube, but I think he's a textbook example of unholy. He may also be the inspiration for Dracula. Imagine being that much of a monster one is created in your likeness. I mean, just looking at the painting of this guy, creeps me out, man. Whoa! Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Eltham Ordinances. Gather round, history enthusiasts, for a tale of palace intrigue, power plays, and good old fashioned cost cutting. Set against the backdrop of the resplendent Tudor court, we bring to you the story of the Eltham Ordinances of 1526. Now, at first glance, the Eltham Ordinances might sound like one of those mundane bureaucratic reshuffles. Picture King Henry VIII draped in his finest robes going, you know what, let's tidy things up a bit and save some pennies while we're at it. But there was so much more bubbling beneath the surface. While Henry was indeed keen on streamlining his royal household, because who doesn't love an efficient monarchy, there were some ulterior motives afoot. And unfortunately for Catherine of Aragon, those motives directly targeted her and her entourage. You see, Catherine was Spanish royalty, and she brought with her a retinue of Spanish attendants. These folks weren't just there to serve her, they were symbols of her power, her influence, and her strong connection to the Spanish court. By 1526, however, Henry's affections for Catherine were waning, and he was on the lookout for ways to clip her wings. So under the guise of reform, the Eltham Ordinances cunningly packed a one-two punch. First, it ousted many of Catherine's Spanish attendants, and second, Second, it subtly pushed Catherine to the sidelines, eroding her standing and influence at court. As the ink dried on the Eltham Ordinances, the message was clear. Henry's commitment to Catherine was on shaky ground, and the great wheels of change were beginning to turn. And as history would soon show, this was just the beginning of these seismic shifts that would rock the Tudor dynasty. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Holy Maid of Kent. Among the pantheon of historical figures who dared defy Henry VIII, few were as audacious and enigmatic as Elizabeth Barton, the famed Holy Maid of Kent. Elizabeth wasn't just another nun in the tapestry of English history, she claimed a direct line to the heavens, experiencing visions and prophecies that drew a growing number of devotees followers. And while visions of saints and divine messages were not uncommon in those days, what set Elizabeth apart was the audacity of her revelations. When she threw shade on Henry's decision to kick Catherine of Aragon to the curb and replace her with Anne Boleyn, she wasn't just gossiping, she was challenging the very foundation of the king's personal and political ambitions. As word of her prophecy spread, Elizabeth became a beacon of hope for those who were none too pleased with Henry's draft religious reforms. But as her star rose, so did the eyebrows of the Tudor court. Henry and his cronies couldn't simply dismiss Elizabeth as a delusional nun, her influence had grown too vast. To the king, she wasn't just a religious anomaly, she was a political threat. Soon enough, the hammer came down. Elizabeth was arrested and under pressure confessed that her divine hotline was in fact a fabrication. Whether this confession was genuine or extracted under duress remains a topic of debate. Regardless, in 1534, the once revered Holy Maid of Kent met her tragic end, executed for treason. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Act of Supremacy. In 1534, King Henry VIII, in a spectacular display of I want what I want and I want it now, decided he was done taking orders from the Pope. Why wait for a middleman in Rome when you can just crown yourself the head honcho of the Church of England, right? With a flourish and probably an exaggerated royal proclamation, Hank declared himself the supreme head of the church. And just to make sure everyone got the memo, he made it treasonous for anyone to say, I think the Pope's still in charge. 
But here's the rub. Not everyone was on board with Henry's DIY approach to religion. Monks, nuns, and some seriously devout Catholics were like, hmm. Better not. They held on to their beliefs, and unsurprisingly, Henry's reaction to this was not exactly understanding or tolerant. Those who dared defy his self declared religious supremacy found themselves on a fast track to persecution. Think imprisonments, property seizures, and yes, many a grim appointment with the executioner's axe. So, as the dust settled on this dramatic chapter of English history, the landscape was forever changed. A king with an inflated ego, a church turned on its head, and many martyrs who paid the ultimate price for their beliefs. In our number 7 spot today, we have the dissolution of the monasteries. Now, picture England from 1536 to 1541, a land filled with ancient abbeys, quiet covenants, and solemn monks chanting away in secluded priories. These weren't just places of worship, but treasured storehouses of art, knowledge, and, oh yes, loads of gold and precious artifacts. Enter King Henry VIII, a monarch with an appetite for power and wives, more on that later. He was always on the lookout for a quick buck, and when he saw the potential gold mine in these religious establishments, he wasn't about to let monkish piety stand in his way. So with a sweeping wave of his royal hand, and perhaps with visions of grand feasts and more velvet tunics, Henry commanded the wrecking of not ten, not a hundred, but over eight hundred monasteries, convents, and friaries. Imagine the scene, ancient stones toppling, once hallowed halls echoing with the clang of soldiers' armor, and precious relics once kissed by pilgrims going up in smoke and being carted off to royal vaults. And how about the monks and nuns? Thousands found themselves suddenly without a home, turfed out of their sacred spaces like last week's bread. Their peaceful lives of prayer and service were disrupted, to say the least. So the next time you're wandering through England and stumble upon the romantic ruins of an old abbey, remember it's not just centuries of time you're looking at, but the legacy of a king who knew how to throw a five year long wrecking party, all in the name of power and coin. In our number 6 spot today, we have the treatment of his wives. Henry is probably the most famous for his wives and the treatment of him, so it's time that we dove into that a little bit at our halfway mark. Catherine of Aragon, who we spoke about a little bit earlier, a Spanish princess with devout Catholic roots. She was Henry's first wife and the mother of Queen Mary I. After 23 years and a quest for a male heir that turned into an infamous annulment saga, Henry split from both Catherine and the Catholic Church. Next up, we have Anne Boleyn, the seductive and savvy courtier who made Henry rethink his entire religious affiliation. With eyes that sparked the English Reformation and a wit to match, Anne gave birth to the future Queen Elizabeth I. Sadly, she lost Henry's affections and, subsequently, her head. Next, we have Jane Seymour, the gentle, calming antidote to the very tumultuous Anne. She did what neither of her predecessors could, bore Henry a son, Edward VI. Unfortunately, she died shortly after childbirth, but not before securing her spot as Henry's quote, favorite wife. She's the only one buried next to him. Next, we have Anne of Cleves, billed as the 16th century version of a blind date gone wrong, arranged to marry Henry based on a portrait. Their union was short lived when he found her less attractive in person. I really, this is real history, I couldn't make this up. Still, they parted on good terms and she lived a comfortable life as the king's beloved sister? Kinda weird. Next we have Catherine Howard, the vivacious teenager with a very scandalous past. Youthful and energetic, she brought some zest back into Henry's life, but her previous affairs caught up with her, leading to yet another tragic beheading. And finally we have Catherine Parr, the mature and nurturing final act in Henry's matrimonial play. More nurse than queen, she cared for an aging and ailing Henry and outlived him, proving that perhaps the sixth time's the charm. So while Henry's love life might have made for a tantalizing court gossip, it's clear his wives bore the brunt of his whims and fantasies. Their stories remind us that behind the glitz and glamour of the Tudor crown were real women facing very real challenges. Number 5. Queen Isabella I The Spanish Inquisition! Pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy 
but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedigan of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right, technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number two, Catherine de' Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father, Henry VIII, ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Kicking off the list at number 10, a fool. While ancient kings have all the riches one man can possibly have, it's still somehow never enough. Kings also have their own walking, talking party. Yeah, how fun is that? The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. These fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, just jumping around on tables, telling jokes, juggling with big pointy shoes, wearing pajamas. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. It was pretty fun. One of the best jobs to have was the title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really, and the fool's payment was no joke. Roland Le Pichur was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As 
as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. Literally, he would show up and fart around. But these fools also held responsibility in their silly little lips. Fools needed to find the balance of humor and wit. It was harder back then than anything. Many of these jesters were given the rule of advisor to the king and queen. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, this is where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them horrible news, but in a fun, positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in naval battle, the British completely wiped them out, and it was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester, the fool, brought this news in a light way. He said to the king, they don't even have the guts to jump into the water like our brave French do. And then he farted and disappeared. Number nine, access to clean water. Today in a modern world, there are things that we just can't live without. A vape pen, Starbucks, and that weird looking back massager that everyone says they bought for their backs, but it's actually for their undercarriage. Speaking of undercarriages, you don't want to drink from the water from underneath one. Dirty, muddy street water is bad for your health. The ancient kings of old knew this. It was common knowledge that drinking dirty water could lead to you spending more time squatting over a hole than spending time with your family, and, and nobody wants that. Life for citizens who were not royals could have it pretty rough. Ancient kings had the luxury of having clean water. Or Somewhat, it's still kind of not so clean, or at least more clean than the commoners. Through methods of fresh spring water, boiling, and even some early filtration methods, they had access to better water that wouldn't make their guts hurt. With that being said, a lot of times, given the sussy nature of water, a lot of kings just drank alcohol, which honestly might have saved them since the alcohol could possibly kill harmful bacteria. The one time in life that boozing might save your life. Anyone got a beer? Number eight, ladies first. These ancient kings, they could literally do whatever they wanted. And it's important to note how they would act if they didn't get what they wanted, right? Like George IV of England, he's referred to as England's worst king by historians. Great title, even worse than King Joffrey, what do you know? It's one thing to spiral into debt, that's classic king behavior. MC Hammer went broke, we get it, it happens. But George IV, he was all about the ladies, a little bit too much. All he wanted in life was just to hook up with women. That was it, his only desire in life. And if they weren't interested, George was known to throw fits. He would cry and stomp his feet, literally. You know how those brave and bold kings do. George would offer these ladies money, although they weren't for sale, so that wasn't a great plan and didn't work a lot of the time. And George would go so far to threaten his own well-being if they refused. How terrible is that guy, right? Just imagine that conversation, how insane. What takes this to the absolute next level though is that George would keep a lock of his partner's hair after they had spent the night together. Now I know you're freaking out, maybe you're like, huh? Maybe you just choked on your rye bread sandwich a bit, that's more than fair. At the time, this wasn't abnormal behavior. I mean, you know, lovers would exchange their hair instead of phone numbers, I get it, it's back in the old days. But George, he had a lot of hair. He had like a lot, a lot of hair. He had like 7,000 envelopes filled with hair. I'm over here exchanging phone numbers at the club. Like, what am I doing wrong? Am I, doink? Call me, peace. Number seven, food. Nice. Whether you like it or not, at some point in your life, you're gonna have to eat. And if you're like me, that means all the time. Steaks, ribs, beer, Burger King, pizza, pasta, ham, and chicken wings. Nice. It should be no surprise that I like beer and barbecue. And to answer your question, yes, I am the most fun guy to be around at the barbecue. Why? I, I just like to have fun and I like to eat good food, man. That, that's just it. Imagine a world, however, where there is no pizza and chicken wings. I know, it's horrible, right? Ugh. Food was always a concern of commoners in ancient times, and as much as I love meat, it wasn't always available. They just didn't live in the industrial agricultural world that we live in today. For Romans, it was a steady diet of breads and nuts, and if they were lucky, maybe some cheese or soup. But for the kings and emperors of old, well, if you feel like vomiting after all you can eat buffets, it makes you feel, you know, some first world kind of guilt, then look no further than ancient kings. Food might be the most excessive way they live, really. All kinds of meats all the time, beer, wine, fresh fruit and vegetables, which for health reasons is pretty huge, and to make them huge, maybe even some desserts. The Egyptians, for example, were known for their sweets. And now I'm hungry. We should go to a banquet together. Number six, 6,000 knights. Being a medieval knight, obviously, it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, all that good stuff. They're saving the damsel in distress in some sort of tower. Well, no, it actually sucked being a knight at all. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone by itself? It's like 55 pounds. All that chainmail underneath your armor. No way, my body, this Q-tip spine would just break in half, no way. I can't even get on a horse wearing jeans and a shirt, let alone chainmail. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You gotta start as a little, little tot, a little 
royal taught. Then you'd be given to a noble to learn and be wise for seven years, some, you know, Yoda type scenario. And then at age 14, you become a squire, a knight's intern. Not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but if you stick it out, just seven more years, then you're an official ting, ting, knight. That's it. But then what? Do kings have two knights? Do they have four each? Is it like a breakdance squad? Is it like eights, groups of eights? Like, do we, how do we do this? Henry II of England could call up to 6,000 knights. This was back in the late 12th century. That's a lot of backup. That's a lot of shiny, majestical backup. My favorite knight still to this day, I don't care, Martin Lawrence. Jamal Scott I Walker. Happy Hey, number five, Pedro of Castile. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, Chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. Gotta get, gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things. Someone to go through life with. Companionship. Love. And if you're lucky, someone who's a good cook or a baker. Oh, love me some baked goods. Mmm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for an example, who loved loving his wife so much that, he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just... God, it doesn't seem right, you know? That just let her, you know, let her let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just ah, Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate. Like I said, at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own. Mm. And had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two, Pope John the Twelfth. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope Mobile is pretty sick, not gonna lie. However, Pope John XII was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's a king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. 
as long as a couple, a couple bad days he said about her. I, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he's telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know. Number 10, King Midas. Most people know the story of King Midas, but in a nutshell, he was a king who was granted the power of the everything he touched turned to solid gold. So, no, he didn't exactly buy anything with that kind of power, but the man can have anything he wants or buy anything he wants. It's a lot of gold. This sounds great, but it's really awful for a couple of reasons. One, that is pretty much the moral of the story, and the other is, well, some basic uh, economy stuff. The first reason this would suck is that one, you should never be too greedy, and you really shouldn't. And you should always be careful what you wish for. This blessing quickly turned into a curse as Midas could no longer eat. Which, that's bad. Not eating and everything you touch turn to gold. Oh, you couldn't hug anybody. It's terrible. The other issue would be his wealth. You'd have to be very careful on how many items you actually touched, as producing too much gold would eventually devalue the price of gold. Especially if you touch a bed or something, that, that's, that's a lot of gold. Imagine how much a solid gold bed would weigh, or how much that would be worth. So in reality, you would be both starving and poor. Number 9, Mansa Musa. Sort of related to the King Midas issue, Mansa Musa was probably the richest man to ever walk the face of the earth. A king from northern Africa who exploited his country's salt and gold reserves. His estimated wealth today would be around the $400 billion mark. $400 billion US, ooh, that's a lot of money. Tough to actually measure it exactly because it was from so long ago, but it could be less, and some say it could actually even be more. Mansa Musa went on tour one year to see all the beautiful things he could of the ancient world, and you can't take a little vacation without buying something at the gift shop. Mansa Musa was so rich and spent so much money in a few towns that he visited that he single-handedly upset the economy of those cities. Elon Musk wishes he could. So he basically bought a lot of stuff, and it was unusual because it upset the economy. Like, he destroyed the economy of those downs. That's insane. Number eight, Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Ah, see, I got you. I pulled a sneaky on you. But yeah, he's still a king. And maybe he was the biggest celebrity who ever lived. Would Halloween really be Halloween without Thriller? And how could cool guys let you know they were cool in the 80s if they didn't have all that leather jacket stuff? You wouldn't be able to know. You just wouldn't. Well, maybe some things you don't know about Michael Jackson were his shopping habits. The man loved shopping. And with that kind of money, well, you can do anything. Well, some may remember his chimp, his Neverland Mansion, complete with carnival rides and arcade, and even an oxygen chamber in case Darth Vader was coming over to stay the night. However, something very strange the man tried to do was he tried to buy a very strange man himself, or rather his bones. For some reason, Michael had a fascination with the Elephant Man, a man with severe facial deformities and freak show performer from the late 1800s. Michael tried to purchase his remains. That's it. That's the point. He tried to buy him. They wouldn't let him, but he tried. That's a weird thing to buy. I've never, when I, whenever I hit the number, I don't go, hey, 1-800-Museum people, someone bring me King Tot. I want it. Number seven, Elvis Presley. Lots of similarities today. Elvis Presley, before Michael Jackson, he was probably the most famous person to ever exist. The king of rock and roll, baby, that's right. All I'll say is phone your grandma and ask her how she feels about him. She probably says she loves his music and those gyrating hips. At the time, it was pretty controversial. Boy, only if they knew what was going on today. Whew. Sorry, 50s Atomic families. Well, being that Elvis Presley was the king and the first celebrity to be idolized the way we do with modern celebrities, he became quite wealthy. Well, with all that money, he bought some weird things, including a chimp. Everyone's buying a monkey. They want a zoo. I don't know. A mansion property he named Graceland, a pink Cadillac for his mother, and strangely enough, he bought FDR's yacht. Yeah, what? That's so weird. Good president, sure, but does it really have room for a monkey in a pink Cadillac? I don't know. Number six, French royalty. This one is more about Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. It's kind of like a two-pack, kind of like a couple, but trust me, it all makes sense in the end. Uh, but it, again, and anything they bought, it was probably the king's wallet, wasn't it? Okay, so when your country is starving, demanding more rights, and in general, life really sucks, what's the next best thing you do? Buy a $12 million necklace. Yeah, right, okay, I've said that before, sure. Okay, Chad, what else? Continue to live your opulent life on the kings and people's dimes. Sure, why not? It makes sense, okay. 
I'm talking too much. Well, something I learned today and something that Taylor showed me is that I guess the last Queen of France was a little lonely. So what did King Louis do to fix this? Spend more time with her? Nay. Buy her a new dog? Nay, sir and madams. He had her pug from Austria imported to the country. And anyone can tell you that when something is imported, you are going to be dishing out a few more dosh. Yes, that's right. They imported her pug from Austria. Imagine how that sounds when your house is literally falling apart, you're starving, and you pay the most taxes. Makes you want to put heads on pikes. That's what it makes you want to do. Can you imagine that? We're all poor and hungry. She's like, well, look at my dog. It's my dog. They're French, they don't sound like that, but this is my dog, look at my dog, here he is. <laughs> Number five, Ferdinand the First of Naples. This one is so strange, I I can't even, I, I have to mention, I, I cannot not say it. In a nutshell, Ferdinand looked normal, just your average European king. I mean, what, what could be wrong about this guy, right? He looks pretty normal. Well, the guy was basically Buffalo Bill. Ferdinand liked to keep his enemies close, taking after a little bit of Michael Corleone. However, so close that oftentimes dinner guests would mysteriously disappear and end up not breathing. Afterwards, they would be mummified and pickled and dressed as if they were still alive. He would then invite more guests over for dinner to show them what could happen if they crossed him. He would open the doors and show them a sick dinner-esque area play thing of people dressed up and that's 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 what bad people do that's what buffalo bill would do that's gross we don't like that number four henry the eighth are you even surprised he's on this list i mean come on it's henry the eighth but i i support all healthy marriages and i support healthy divorces sometimes things just don't work out but that doesn't mean you have to go all johnny depp on the situation there's better ways to work things out well, in Henry's case, it may not be televised on national TV, or global TV in this case. It was more like Edward Scissorhands, if you will. Henry VIII is famous for dealing with his wives. When the church would not grant him the divorce he so wished for, he removed his wife's head from her body. And then he remarried and divorced another, and then he, uh, well, another one lost her head, and then divorced another, and then finally he passed away and the wife lived on. It makes sense, sure, that's, all I'm saying is the man went a little too far. That's all I'm saying, just a little bit. Number three, John King of England. This is the dude who wrote the Magna Carta, which for legal students everywhere is like planet Krypton. It's where it all starts. The whole Superman, the law, everything. It's the basis of everything. Besides Hammurabi's code, of course. Well, it's not like he signed it very enthusiastically, and the man really wasn't the nicest. He's also known for taking 22 of his most noble knights and throwing them away in a dungeon until they starved and didn't wake up for, well, no breakfast. He betrayed his brother Richard the Lionheart, the very famous Richard the Lionheart, who also wasn't very nice either, and is suspected of being the mastermind behind the delifing of his nephew. Ooh, talk about family scandal. Number two, Napoleon Bonaparte. I know, hear me out though. The story of France and Napoleon is one for the history books. I mean, really, it's, it's so strange. Imagine a country that violently overthrows its king and queen, and then while in the middle of that, which could be described as the worst political strife in history, you then go to war, which, if you know how that, it's, it's not a good idea. You, 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 you're probably going to lose. Except Napoleon didn't lose. Napoleon took France to war like five times within a, a short time period and won most of them. It's pretty good. Well, good for winning, not good for the people that make it. That's when he declared himself Emperor of France and kind of lost his way, which it's stupid because it defeated the whole purpose and point of the revolution and the democracy that the people were so fighting for. Eventually the international community caught up with him and banned him to an island twice because he came back and said, I'm back. And then no, back to the island. Go, go back. You're going, you're going back. Number one, Elvis Presley. Look, I know, I know it's it's Elvis, but he's the king of rock and roll, man. You, you can't go wrong with Elvis. It, plus, it kind of works, too, because I think people have a really good image of him, but he actually wasn't... You'll see. He is the king of rock and roll, to be fair, and he's more famous than any king on this list, actually. But the king of rock and roll isn't so squeaky clean and certainly not a stranger to crime and scandal. At some points in his career, you could find him excessive drinking and using um, illicit substances, if you will. He might have had to put on those jailhouse rocking denims, well, for real. Back in 1956, at the 
peak of his fame, really, Elvis got into a physical altercation with two gas station attendants after fans began to crowd him. It was a messy situation, and he was actually up on charges of battery and disorderly conduct. Not a good look for the king, baby. At number 10, Blinded by Ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like, these gals were absolutely ruthless, and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like, ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries, and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene, who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836, and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So, Surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is, until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now, to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel is corset poke off but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks that should be a musical not frozen get out of here at number eight no side bays a bad relationship can really mess you up anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de medici did back in the day her didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken she basically turned into the type of person that was like if i'm not happy no one else is gonna be happy either Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress, and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband, though, Catherine Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26. So so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standards, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. I 
number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, Tamiris. Honestly, every time I face her in Civilization VI, it just ends badly. I'll spend a few turns building my economy or maybe organizing some troops, and I look back over at her cities and she's already amassed a massive army and is ahead in science. Yeah, I'm not the best Civ VI player, but sheesh lady, come on, give me a break. This probably has something to do with her real life counterpart. Tamiris was a woman who lost her son to Cyrus the Great. So she said to herself, I don't know what's so great about this Cyrus guy. There's a trailer park voice reference in there somewhere. Just imagine Ricky telling Cyrus off. I don't know, you, you gotta find it. Basically, after losing her son, she gathered the troops and commenced battle. The almighty Cyrus met his end, which given how the way women were treated back then probably didn't go over too well with PR. Yeah, she got her revenge though. Number four, the Trung sisters. The Trung sisters are double trouble. You're getting two queens at once here. China was being down bad and trying to conquer some things that maybe they shouldn't have. Naughty, no. The Trung sisters came to answer the call. These girls are actually revered as heroes still today in Vietnam. But what they were able to do for so long was very impressive. China had a very impressive army, no surprise there. And Vietnam was a much smaller country or kingdom, I guess you'd say, and their army was not as impressive. But the sisters managed to hold them off for three years. Three years with their forces. That That is crazy good. That is very impressive and perhaps a lot of bloodshed too. Sadly, the sisters waded off into the waters before they could be captured because after that long fighting, I wouldn't want to be captured either. Number three, Grace O'Malley. Have I see land lovers? Ye be looking for Grace O'Malley. Well, then ye come to the right place, sir. Thank you, thank you. That is my private impression. I will be here all week. Bad impressions aside, Grace O'Malley wasn't a traditional queen to be fair, but what she didn't have in regular queen qualities, she did make up for that in being a badass pirate. Nice. This is another one where I'm gonna ask Hollywood for a movie, please. Irish Pirate Queen? Come on guys, that's just a movie begging to be made. Grace O'Malley was a fierce pirate from the age of 11 and a wise woman who ruled the seas after her father's passing. I don't really have much to say after that, to be honest. I'll just wait for Hollywood to make their move. And maybe you can cast me in there. And I can put on some long red hair and some boots and I could, I could swim and just put the red hair on me right now. I just look so good. <laughs> Number two, Queen Victoria. Okay, hear me out on this one. This one has more to do with their lineage, per se, than her, but it's her somewhat to blame. Okay, so Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, King George V of Britain, and Wilhelm Kaiser II of Germany were all first cousins. Their grandma was Queen Victoria. What? I, I know, right? Isn't that, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's weird. Imagine how crazy your bloodline has to be for that. And, you know, the fact that during World War I, all three of these cousins were at war with each other. I mean, that, that's just insane. I mean, families fight, sure, but come on, man. Get the mustard gas off the table, bro. Come on. That's cheap stones. Number one, my mom. My mom, I love her so much. She, she's the best. But man, sometimes, oh, she's so unfair. 
I had to do chores when I was a kid, and I had to put down the toilet seat, and worst of all, she made me put the little toothpaste back in the tube when I was done with it. Ugh! I mean, come on, right? Not like she ever did anything for me, like birth me, feed me, raise me, clothe me, and love me unconditionally. And now I gotta make my bed? Oh, this is the worst day ever! I'm sure no other cute boy with blue eyes like me ever had this problem. Ugh! Okay, comment reading time. Uh, we got a comment from Captain America. He said, Your impressions are hilarious. Keep up the great work, sir. Thank you very much, Captain America, and thank you and, and, and all the Avengers for the good work that you do. Thank, thank you to Iron Man. He's a cool guy. I like him. And Spider-Man. Tell Spider-Man I said hello. Thank you, Captain America. Uh, Nick Pearlberg said, as a fellow big guy, I appreciate you, Chetty. Oh, I bow to you, sir. I bow to any other large gentleman portly sir out there. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Wow, that's so nice. Uh, Jelly Helma says, crazy. I was crazy once. They locked me in a little white room. I liked it there. I died there. They buried me where the flowers grow. One grew down and tickled my nose. It almost drove me crazy. Crazy. I was crazy once. Ah, <laughs> God, he's this good. He's very nice. I like. And finally, we have Curious Man. Uh, Curious Man said, Worst job ever, shoveling concrete in July in Fargo, North Dakota. Runner up, uh, plastic pipe butt welder in an unair conditioned steel building in July in Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah, that is not fun, dude. That was from the video when I asked uh, worst jobs ever. Yeah, that is not fun. Sweating, I used to work in a, in a, play, in a garden center, and it, man, it had no air conditioning and 40 degree weather. As you can imagine, Chetty did not do too well there. I, I was sweating quite, uh, <laughs> had to change my shirts a couple times, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift, but if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. 
And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love. Maybe a bit too much. Hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work, even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin? They have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you. I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death, every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number five, big money. This is no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, but back in the day, I'd argue the division between wealth and poor was larger than today. Kings had it all. I mean, if you listen to what Taylor's saying, he, he knows what he's talking about. Food, water, power, what else is there? Well, how about the coinage to make it all happen? The bread, the guap, the dosh, and my favorite, the cheddar. Yes, that's right, the ancient king's wealth. Whatever they didn't already possess, they could take by force or simply just bought with incalculable riches. With uncalculable riches. So much money, they had so much money. I can't make it clear, they had a lot of money. A great example of this was Mansa Musa, a very wealthy king from the Mali Empire. It's speculated he might have been the wealthiest person to ever walk the face of the earth. Earning his riches through the trading of gold and salt, he decided to show the international community how rich he was and went on tour, because that's just something you do when you have millions of dollars, I guess. Where in multiple cities, he spent and gave away so much gold that it upset the city's economies. That is, that is, a, that is a big flex, okay. Donald Trump might have hotels, but Mansa Musa has everything else. It's kind of like Monopoly when one player has a boatload of cash and they go from one good property to the next. So you know if they land on something, they get all the cold hard. So even if they land on something, they got all the cold hard cash to deal with it. Plus, they also have some good property and they just make it back every turn anyway. I'm fed up with Monopoly. Number four, King of Castles. King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tale castles. Yeah, let's call this inspiration, I guess. What a privilege this ought to be. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the King of Bavaria back in 1864. And then he had castles built as, you know, he was inspired from romantic literature and spending time at the opera. You hear that, Andrew? He was inspired after the opera. What a poet. It's crazy. Crazy. Must be nice, right? King Ludwig II would spend his nights in one castle, looking through his fancy telescope, admiring the next castle being built. What a, what? Who, ha? He even freestyled the castle as well. Yeah, just four years in, the guy designed his own majestical castle. And to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world, so clearly he did something right. 
Neuschwanstein Castle, literal fairy tale. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm over here making castles in Minecraft. Still fun, we'll take it. Number three, jousting. First there is bread, and then there is wine, and then there is entertainment. You can't tell me why a delicious plate of nachos dances like a ballerina in your microwave, you didn't pull up some super cool content to watch on your phone. Maybe featuring a large kind of funny comedian, and maybe also featuring a super handsome tall funny comedian with a neck thing, I don't know. Kings of Yieldy Times did not possess the power of the internet or watching fail videos, so watching combat sports was the next best thing. Oh, what's that I hear? Watching the sport isn't enough? Well, some royalty even got involved. King Henry VIII, for example, just loved to joust because because he did. He even had an accident with such, and it's what might have made him gone mad in the first place. Number two, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Here we go. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, the guy banned coffee. What a monster. I would be asleep right now if coffee wasn't a thing. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he got a little wiser, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, may I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. The guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a, what a fun guy. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades just wandering the roads. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather Murad IV himself would just take off his hood and be like, surprise, and then he would take off your head. Right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All that for some stale ale. What a monster. Number one, groom of the stool. For some reason, this job was considered to be higher up, a well-respected job, if you will. However, I'd like to ask the man in charge of such an operation how he felt. Imagine, I can imagine he wasn't too fond of his job. Hands never clean, hands never clean. The groom of the stool is someone who would assist the king in his bathroom duties by supplying fresh water, towels, and whatever a king needs. He may have also been responsible for cleaning the forbidden starfish. May the divines of Skyrim have mercy on his soul. I guess this had to be done, but I don't know if I could ever even do that to another human being. If you've ever eaten Taco Bell late at night and washed it down with some Baja Blast, then you know the kind of explosion awaits the porcelain throne in the morning. So yes, having a servant present at your bowel movements is a privilege that most other folks just didn't have, but would you really want one? Number 10, what a drag. Bachelor number one. What would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William I, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman King of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number nine, let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason, the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry and you're living fat with high society, you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number eight, cashback. King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money. Which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still gonna boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, 
He sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I hate to loan this guy a nickel. Number 7. Terrible Ivan. He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell them about the other world monuments? Number 6. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons, another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number 5. Charlotte Augusta Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back. I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day, and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rocked the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, that's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died, spoiler alert. So the older, the better at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrant. Only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like a conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. 
and was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6, 1540. Anne later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. Last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now as a young in, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. What do you guys think? Guys, those were our top 10 unusual ways that ancient queens died. If a video on ancient kings is something you want to see, you know, hit that thumbs up. You know what to do. Hit the subscribe and then I'll return with all the goods. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later. But Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. We'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary frog. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clew Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish.
Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number seven, Mary, Queen of Scots. I told you I was gonna bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're gonna talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there, that's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic, keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. 
gone. Rainey killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Architatus, son of King Eris I. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you. Or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup. Like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others, not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. Kicking off the list at number 10, a goodnight kiss. We'll start off funny, okay? History can be funny sometimes, even when it's not meant to be, and it's meant to be completely serious. I can't help but read this information and laugh. Royals were sweating constantly about people trying to take them out, of course. I mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy stalked the queen over and over for years. Historically, these royals have been on the lookout for enemies, and the way that they prevent these attacks, yeah, sometimes it can be a little funny. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you heard about this weird position in the castle? What an odd job this is. A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned their ale, which is, you know, a pretty lousy job there. Either having a good day or a bad day, no in between. But they also had a guy kiss the king's sheets every day, just, they just kissed the entire bed. The king size, may I remind you, massive bed. King Henry VIII, this guy hired somebody to literally just go in, get snuggled up, and just make sure the king's bed wasn't poisoned. There's nothing on it that's gonna make the skin go all ouchy. But he would just get in his bed and just Let's go to sleep for a bit. You are required to make the king's bed every morning, of course, and before he gets back in, you gotta get in and you gotta get in and kiss that bed, man. You gotta kiss that bed real good. Mwah, mwah. Let's go. Mwah. All right, time to clock out for the day. Mwah. One more for good luck. Clothes as well. That was touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure worn and touched. With It's so weird. Guy's wearing my clothes in my bed. 
No way, I'd rather get poisoned. Like, yo, take my jeans off. Who is that guy? Get back here. Like, imagine marrying that king, and it's like, oh, hang on, before we get snugged in, this guy has to go and kiss your sheets. She's like, ew, what? Why does my sheets smell like breath? Everything smells like breath. Number nine, enemas. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the household. This, yeah. Back in the olden days, ye olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Well, rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies. Specifically, King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. Just big old fan of enemas. It's believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Thousands, it's a lot of, a lot of decimals. Decimals for enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. Like, guy, that's like 112 too much, I'd say. I don't know. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier, by using um, almond milk for the enemas. Imagine being married to a guy, and he pulls out almond milk, and you're like, oh, no, not again. Come on, Louis, please, I just ate. Number eight, no bathing in this house. Bathing in the olden days wasn't fully understood, if that makes any sense. Like in a medical book, in an official 16th century medical book, the medical advice was use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? What? What does it even mean? Why is every shred of medical knowledge always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century. A doctor would just be like, ah, yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick and you'll be on your way. Like, what? Do you have any halls? Help me. Help me, dude. No, I'm just mad. I just, like, bro, I have pneumonia. I need, I need medicine. So, of course, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. Of course. So, King James IV, apparently, this guy never took a bath in his life. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass lice to others just by being in the same room that he was earlier. So not at the same time, he would come in, do his king stuff, leave, and the lice would be like, Pew! and they would just wait in that room and get on someone else. That's so gross, that's horrible. Lice would emit off this man, like the, he's like the stinky kid from Charlie Brown with the stinky cloud. That's just like lice around this guy. <laughs> Margaret Tudor was married to King James. Yeah, must have loved the no bathing thing, eh? Oh, oh boy. Number seven, Queen Caroline. Queen Caroline, ba, ba, ba. She went out in a horrible way. We can't sing about her. History remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she went out. It was bad. It was actually written down in an epigram attributed to the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Again, it rhymes. Why, do all the, why is everything rhyming? This is so awful. Who can be like, yeah, yeah, write that down, that's good, that's good, wait, wait, it does rhyme, that's good, that checks out. Rest in peace, my gosh, her husband, he was certainly no help at all. Caroline was previously married to George IV, and this guy locked her out of Westminster on coronation day. So yeah, she went out in a horrible way, but let's not forget the marriage that came beforehand. That wasn't pleasant either, nothing in this guy or this marriage was pleasant. Number six, Henry VIII. Of course he's back, he had six wives and it was pretty much entirely bad for all of them, yeah. It was the late 1400s. Henry took the throne in 1509. This guy was only 17 years old when all this madness began to unfold. Only days after the execution of Anne, who I mentioned on part one of this list, so days after he married his third wife, Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour's mothers were first cousins, so they were close, and during all of this, they, of course, went head to head more than once. Jane died shortly after giving birth to Edward VI on October 12, 1537. I can't mention King Henry's wives and leave a couple out. This is just a history channel. We have to mention all of them, okay? Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal, of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well, let them eat cake 
which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive so to speak so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again well after the empress was with him and that made things a little complicated but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka the Lost Queen of Egypt, was only 15 years old when she married 16-year-old Akhenaten. Now, alongside her new young husband, she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens, or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Atan. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Atan was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people, and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally, coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII, ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria, during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen, because there was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack, and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag, your order has arrived. 
Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. See, what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal Curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crowns still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues. Okay. Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace. Just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know. Just, I don't know, use your imagination, I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head. That's sad. It's tragic. And another professor died in 1936 shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbags. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Bolin. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Bolin. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial, so somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest, horrible, that's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy, listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. 
So Mary was close, but now what? While Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if you're family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five, King of Egypt. His Majesty Farouk I, by the grace of God, King of Egypt and the Sudan, that was his full title, was disposed during his nation's 1952 revolution and spent the remainder of his days in exile to Italy. In his haste to avoid getting the Mussolini treatment, he left behind a majority of his most prized possessions. When the people got a look at what he was uh, storing behind the walls of his residence, they were a bit disgusted to find an excessive number of expensive suits, rare stamps and coins, jewels, luxury vehicles and many other things that I will never afford. Now, what else would he have that would be considered strange? I'll let you take a guess. Was it A, a blam blam cache? B, piles and piles of a white substance that made the 80s fun? Or C, an unsettling amount of gardening magazines? Go ahead and let us know in the comments below. I'll give you a second. Mm -hmm. Do, 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 do. Nope, time's up. If you said secret option D, you'd be right. What was it, you ask? Well, it was a disturbing amount of adult entertainment. So much so, it wouldn't even fit underneath his mattress. Man, that's, that's a lot. That's too much. That's too much. Number four, Peter the Third. Remember the last time you played with your toys as a kid? The same. And let us know what your favorite toys were as a kid. Let's see if we have some shared favorites. I'm actually curious. That's kind of a cool thing to talk about. Well, for Peter the Third, it was little army men, or tin soldiers, I guess you'd call them. And yes, he played with them as an adult, staging mock battles. Is it the weirdest thing ever? No, it's not. But he was a king, so that's a wee bit strange. Hey, I love army men just as much as the next guy, especially those little green plastic dudes. I used to love those video games too. Very underrated in my opinion. I love that stuff. It also makes me think of that scene in Spaceballs. Enough references aside, you never really know someone until you've seen the money they've spent on their army men collection. Number three, Ibrahim the first. Fur, fur everywhere. Ibrahim I of the Ottoman Empire was the 18th Sultan and the number one purchaser of fine furs. Personally, I've never had any fine furs. I grew up in the trailer park and mama always said that fur was cruel anyway, so I never felt the luxury of uh, fine furs, if you will. It must be nice because Ibrahim loved them so much. Like, he really, really loved them. His whole wardrobe consisted of them, in fact. Plus, his walls were covered in them, and apparently even his curtains. I don't do well in heat, so I'll pass on that. I'd be sweating way too much. Too much fur. Number two, the locksmith. Who are you and how'd you get in here? I'm the locksmith and uh, I'm the locksmith. Classic Leslie Nielsen. God, I love that guy. I love those movies. I'd love to make one one day. We're starring one. Hollywood, call me. King Louis the 16th, the last king of France. We're back to him again. The man spent his time and money on something rather strange. No, not all was spent on his wife and her life. And yeah, I'm kind of putting him on the list twice, but trust me, it's weird. I mean, come on, he gave the queen whatever the heck she he wanted. Well, apparently he loved to spend his time and money on locksmithing. What? Yeah, that's so weird. He would spend his time trying to get into locks and understand them. He was also stated as saying that every man should have a passion. Hey, maybe put down the locks and start helping the people as a passion. There's an idea. What a great idea. Feed the people. Instead, I'm just going to work on this lock. I'm just going to go ahead and just, yeah, almost got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number one, Christian the seventh of Denmark. I saw this and I just, I just had to put it on here. I mean, come on. Apparently, the guy wasn't very mentally stable. I mean, who is these days? Apparently, the royal spent a lot of his time uh, waxing his carrot, polishing the flagpole, tenderizing the gabagoo, charming the snake, uh, self-firing on all cylinders, the one-handed bedroom dance, uh, what I did all summer long in high school. You get the point, okay? You understand what I'm trying to say. Truth of the matter is, you don't get there with a little help from Vaseline or St. Ives. The man bought time so he could be this way. The man is either a legend or a crazy person. Imagine having that much money and that much time in your day that that's all you do. Yeah.